It's David Aronovich. Uh, comrades, I'd, I'd like you all to stand, please, and join with me. Please stand, those of you who can. And join with me in a rendition of the Internationale. For foreign comrades amongst you who don't know the words in English, when I give the salute, you can join in. Okay, are you ready? Arise, ye starvelings from your slumbers. Arise, ye criminals of want. For reason in revolt now thunders, and at last ends the age of Kant. Then away with all your superstitions. Servile masses, arise, arise. We'll change forth with the old conditions and spurn the dust to win the prize. The salute. Then come, come on, raids, come rally. And the last fight let us face. The internationale unites the human race. Then comrades come rally, and the last fight let us face. The internationale unites the human race. You may sit. Thank you. I must say, I find that slightly disappointing. <laughs> that song was played, the last time I heard it, at the end of the funeral of the historian Eric Hobsbawm in October of 2012. It was also played at the end of the funeral of my father, Sam, in 1998, and at the end of my mother's funeral in 2005. Uh, not only were they played, but also the people who were there knew the words uh, and could sing it. Um, and you can judge for yourself what might have been going through the minds of people who would know the words of that well enough not to require a song sheet. You could also tell that I didn't. I've never had to look up those words. I've known them since I was a child. Nowadays, if you want to... Oh, by the way, you're probably wanting to know if I'm going to have that played at the end of my funeral. No, I'm going to have Ripple by the Grateful Dead um, on the basis that it will have everybody crying as they go out, which is the sole objective of my funeral, as, as I can't plan it from behind the ground. But if you want to see it now, you can go on YouTube and you will find that the most spirited renditions of that are probably the North Korean Army Choir. Um, seriously, they really are. They have, all have incredible lots of medals, presumably for singing, since they haven't fought a war for quite a long time. You get medals for singing songs very loudly, and these fabulously large hats, and so on, and they're not very large people, so the hats are almost as high as they are. Um, the reason why that was played and sung at my parents' funerals, but they both had been, for almost all their adult lives, members of the British Communist Party. When I was born, my father was already a full-time worker for the British Communist Party. In other words, we weren't just card-carrying members, as it was always called, of the British Communist Party, and there were Communist Party cards. But my father, actually, that was his job, was bringing about the democratic working-class revolution in Britain um, full-time. That's what he did. And my mother was a full-time supporter, therefore, of that business which she entirely concurred in and which she entirely wanted to bring about. Um, my father's uh, existence as a full-time worker for the Communist Party is actually documented both in literature, in Doris Lessing's The Golden Notebook, where she meets a comrade Jim or a comrade Bill, I can't remember off the top of my head, uh, when she joins the party, that was my father, and also in her, uh, in her autobiography. Um, at that time, he was cultural secretary of the party. It was in the early 1950s. Now, 
My father's route to join the British Communist Party, in a sense, was one that you could readily understand. He was born into a poverty-stricken Jewish family in the East End of London, just after the First World War. Um, his father was a second-hand clothes repairer. The family lived in one room in just off Cable Street um, in, in, in East London. The world around him was entirely consistent, uh, consisted of grime and poverty, and my father as a child and as a young man, became incredibly angry about this. He was, if you like, radicalized, but radicalized by condition in that situation rather than necessarily by, uh, by ideas. And he felt a sense after leaving school at 14, wandering around the East End trying to get a job, seeing his father beaten down uh, for work by people who are wealthier just to try and beat him down in terms of the cost, etc., knowing how badly they lived. And he rationalized it when he heard about Marxism, encountered the Young Communist League, as part of a world system of capitalist oppression of working class people and others, which it was down to him to become part of the struggle against. So that's what he became. During the war, he went up to Glasgow um, and became an organizer for the Communist Party. He was in the Clyde, one of the factories, the uh, Rolls-Royce factories on the Clyde during the war uh, and became a full-time worker for the Communist Party. My mother, it was slightly different. My mother had been born uh, to, the, uh, to an army family, um, a slightly bohemian army family, and her mother died when she was seven, died of a gnat bite, the kind of thing that you don't die of these days because of antibiotics, that therefore probably, if we don't sort out the antibiotics problem, we can easily die of again in a few years' time. So she died when my mother was seven, leaving behind three daughters. My grandfather, who was in the army, couldn't take the three daughters back, farmed them out on different uh, uh, people in the country who were guardians, friends of his, uh, of his wife's. But then, when he started a new family with a new woman, did not call for his children back. He started a new family without them. Not so unusual in those days. We would think it very unusual. That left my mother with a sense of uh, being betrayed which lasted her entire life. It was, if you like, the kind of underlying psychological reality of her, of her existence. So she was a woman who was always seeking affiliation and loyalty because she felt that she hadn't got it. But she was also, in a very real sense, a Bolshe, what we call in the English sense of Bolshe. Even before she was a communist, she was a Bolshe because she also had a deep sense of anger about what had been done to her. And to, in many ways, this came out as a kind of political feeling about the class system in Britain, so well described by Orwell, who we'll come to in a moment, um, uh, uh, so well described by Orwell, this sense of kind of dark class struggle in which the ruling classes suppressed everybody else. Um, so that's, that's the origins of my parents. She joined the Communist Party about 1951, met my father in 1954, and so on. Um, and by the time I was sentient, we were a communist family in a communist community working on behalf of this democratic revolution. And this was to be at a kind of 90 degree angle to the rest of society. So I was brought up with a whole series of attitudes that were not predominant in us. In fact, they were more or less contrary. Um, we were for things we were for that other people were against. We were for Russia when people thought Russia was a very bad thing. We were for militant trades unionists. Um, and actually, unlike other people, we did not regard the word militant as some form of insult. We regarded it as a kind of a compliment. We were in favor of strikes. Uh, we liked them, pickets. We thought those were good too. We liked black people. And you've got to understand that in the context of Britain in the 1950s and 60s, that was relatively unusual uh, and so on. Uh, people easily forget, they really do easily forget, the casual, ingrained, daily, everyday racism of large parts of British society in the period of the 50s and 60s. It was absolutely in the days when you could still walk in an area like this and see signs in the windows saying no blacks, no Irish, uh, uh, and so on. Um, what they were against, well, they were against the monarchy, um, uh, of course, a bunch of sponges and ridiculous people wearing absurd crowns and going, and, and you, can, you can imagine, people still see these things this day. They were against the state, as it was 
uh, uh, then. So my mother, during, uh, when she kept, she kept a diary, during Churchill's funeral, which was a matter of incredible reference. You know, the BBC had Richard Dimbleby on it, hushed tones, the gun carriage, car sweeps down, etc., etc. The cranes, the people who are, uh, are old enough will remember that the cranes dipped along the docks. So my mother just wrote another bloody hoo-ha about Churchill dying, um, uh, and so on. Uh, we disliked the police. The police were on the side of the state and so on. So when I was actually arrested at a demonstration at the age of 17, it was regarded by my parents as something of a badge, badge of honour. It was almost like a kind of communist bar mitzvah, uh, <laughs> really. It was kind of, you know, something that you needed to go through as a kind of rite of passage uh, and so on. Uh, and also because we regarded it as being bad demonstration craft to get arrested so you do it once but you don't do it again so it's a combination of bar mitzvah and that night you first got blotto and sick and you didn't need to do it again um, uh, we were against the bourgeois press which has I have to admit currently an incredible uh, irony um, <laughs> Because you don't get much more bourgeois when it comes to press than the Times is or done. If you'd told me at the age of 18 that I'd wind up as a Times columnist, I would have called you all kinds of odd things. We were against colonialism, neo-colonialism, as I've said, against racism, against apartheid in South Africa when, believe it or not, most conservatives thought apartheid in South Africa was probably a fairly decent thing to do. Um, you can't find any conservatives like that anymore. Uh, that's all finished, of course. Um, and in fact, you can't find anybody who was ever like that, despite the fact that, in fact, we know that they were. Um, we... I knew, as an eight, seven, eight-year-old, my side in every single conflict in the world because the party pronounced on every single conflict in the world. There wasn't, we could take, we haven't got time, but we could do a test later. I was going to say, you throw a conflict at me from that period, and I'll tell you what side we were on and why we were on that side. But it wasn't just every, every conflict in the world then. It was every conflict there had ever been in the history of the world. So... Athens versus Sparta, you think, uh, or Athens versus Persia, you think the Communist Party doesn't have a view on Athens versus Persia. Wrong. Okay. Athens is an example of a struggling, nascent democracy in the face of, uh, uh, in the face of feudalism. It's easy enough to be on the side of Spartacus, right, okay, in the, against the Roman Republic. After all, who's Spartacus? Thank you very much. Of course you are. Of course you are. Um, uh, but when you come down to some more the kind of recondite and sort of difficult moments, so for instance, in the English Civil War, whose side are you? Who, uh, let's just try this. Who is on the side of the roundheads here? Don't ask me who the roundheads are. This is your, okay. Who's on the side of the roundheads? About, I can see about eight. Who's on the side of the cavaliers? Come in, I can't see... Are you trying to tell me that are the whole lot of you who are on either side? Okay, who of you is not on either side? Who's dead? Who's just died? Okay. You are on the side of the roundheads because the roundheads are on the side of the world historical process. Okay, because they represent the absolutely necessary transition from feudalism to mercantile capitalism. Obviously. Okay. If at the same time you could also find space for the levelers and the diggers who were kind of prototypical uh, communists, that would be good too. But you have to understand that in the kind of big clash, we're on the side of the roundheads. Zulu war, whose side are you on? You're on the side of the Zulus, for God's sake. Indian mutiny, on the side of the mutineers, etc. You wouldn't erect a statue to, to, to Canning or somebody like that, even if he is, gets get clemency. Whose side are you on the World War I? World War I, who's on the side of the Allies in World War I? Here, come on, put your hands up. And who's on the side of the Germans? See? The answer is, you're on the side of the international working class. And that was an imperialist struggle. How dare you take sides in an imperialist struggle? Absolutely ridiculous. You should know that no proper side in a modern struggle can be possible until the great October Revolution of 1917. We have alternative history. We had alternative history. You give me Waterloo, I give you back Peterloo. You give me Palmerston, I'll give you the Chartists. I'll give you the history of the English working class, the Scottish working class, the Welsh working class. We had party writers, 
party artists, party composers. We had party children's book authors. We had party builders. Um, we did. They weren't very good, but they were party builders. I don't mean they built the party. They did build the party, but they also were builders who were party men. Most notoriously, we had a party dentist. Um, uh, she was not a very good dentist, but I didn't realise that until later, but she, I think she'd been in the French Resistance or something like that. Anyway, she was also a Communist Party member, and she did not believe in anaesthetic. So, <laughs> if you look at this tooth here, you see that? That's capped. That's capped because by our house, there was the road that led up to Marx's tomb, but it's simply a coincidence. And the Russian spacemen came up there in 1961 to 1965 in there. So I stood on the dustbin to see them. I slipped off and I chipped that tooth. So off I go to the party dentist, and she then takes out the nerve in that tooth without anaesthetic. And she just says, and she leaves my, hand, uh, my head back on her bosom, and she says, now you just be a big boy, etc." And so from then on, I thought that's what dentists did instead of anesthetic. You put your hair... It wasn't until she fell out with my mother about my father, who had to leave working full-time for the party, in such a way that my mother, in high dudgeon, took us to a dentist up the road who I discovered did use anesthetic. Um, we had music... Folk and protest music. There's a strange liking that the left has for folk music, thinking it is the music of the folk. Um, it may once have been the music of some folk, but by the time you get to sing it, it was a long time ago, and the current folk have all forgotten it. But left wing people love male voice choirs and folk music and so on. Um, so we had songs, lots of really, really great songs. Um, for instance, okay, um, who, who remembers Green Grow the Rushes, though? Yeah. Don't you sing there? Okay, so, I'll give you five O. Oh. Red fly the banners, oh, what are your five O? Oh? Five in the years of five-year plan and four for the four years taken. Three, three, the rights of man. Two, two, the workers' arms working for his living, oh. One is workers' unity and evermore shall be so. I didn't even need to remember that either because I remember that so young. Books, left-wing books on all the shelves. In fact, I learned my first naughty words from Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex. So I first saw the word penis in print next to the term castration complex, <laughs> which was a bit of a problem. We had lots of Lenin. Stalin had been banished to, a, to the box room, to a little kind of dusty room. No George Orwell. No George Orwell. George Orwell was a traitor, so he wasn't on any of the, uh, on any of the shelves. If we were pessimistic, it was because we were isolated, being the one who never got any votes. And I remember being told by a boy at school when he said, what did your father do? And I said, he was a full-time worker for the Communist Party. And he stopped, and this is absolutely true. And he looked at me, he said, but that's not possible. I said, why is it not possible? He said, because I know that all the communists have been shot. <laughs> um, I said, well, okay, but, and I know slightly differently. Um, but if we were optimistic, it was because we thought that the victory of the world international working class, and therefore us, was somehow inevitable, if not in Britain and somewhere else, in Cuba, and also in that problematic place, Russia, where Gagarin went up in space, where they had whole cities devoted to science, where there was rational plan production, people went to sanatoria, there were workers' rest homes, and so on. What I didn't realise at the time was that actually my folks were the ones who had lingered on. They'd lingered on through the show trials, through the Cold War, through Stalin, through Khrushchev's secret speech, um, through the trial and execution in Eastern Europe of people they'd actually known uh, during the war and afterwards, defending these ideas of plots and conspiracies, through the death of Stalin, Hungary, etc. Uh, and they had, with their bravery, their courage, and so on, and also excuses, denials, evasions. Uh, Marcus talked about the state of knowing but not knowing. Funnily enough, it's a very big part in my own book, unknown knowns. And, but one thing he said was not quite right. It's not just politicians who have known unknowns. Everybody does it. I'll end because I end the book by bringing it round to the problem of my father's own affairs and philandering, which my far mother, for many years, refused to understand was going on. And a friend of mine called Steve Gross wrote a book called The Examined Life, 
told me about somebody who had an analysis, a very nice woman, who it became very clear very early on that her husband was having an affair, but she just couldn't see it. And then one day she came in and she told him, she said, it's a funny thing, she said, uh, uh, Mr. Gray. She said, um, uh, I got a phone call from somebody at my husband's office. And he said, hello, he said, is Shagger in? Um, <laughs> And even then, she was reluctant to admit the thing. And this is the thing which I kind of want to leave you with. Uh, this is a very, very human thing. When you commit yourself entirely to something so that admitting the truth means a relinquishing of everything that you've believed and wanted and known and that make your life worth living, you are actually extraordinarily unlikely to believe that that thing has gone. Um, and uh, I'll end it there. Thank you very much.